together in your name. We thank you for the uh, weather being uh, bright and sun sunny rather than rainy today. We thank you for your provision there. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together to fellowship, to um, just meet with one another, and to meet with you. Uh, help us just to uh, worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to shut out the distractions of our lives, um, even the distractions around us, and to focus on you and your things. Uh, help us just to uh, be glad and worship. And, uh, Help us just to uh, turn to you, uh, be inspired by you, and to uh, seek to live for you each day of our lives. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Put your hands together. Beautiful day. 
I'm getting burned, I think. <laughs> He's in the shade, I'm over here like... I'm fine with that, though. Thank God for a glorious day. Last time it rained. Uh, those of you remember last time we were supposed to have it outside, it rained, so... Uh, Thankfully and, uh, we can do it here. <laughs> Just so everyone does know, there should be lyrics in your bulletin. Forgot to mention, if you do need those lyrics, they should be in there for you. Thank you. 
worthy is thou.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning thankful to be here with you. Lord, what an honor it is to sing right here in our city, to have this opportunity, Lord, to seek you and to show the world that you bring hope, Lord, to every situation. Lord, that's what we sing about this morning. That's why we glorify you, is you are the hope for all. You are the beginning of love, Lord, that all this world needs to experience. Help us to look to you this morning as the author of hope and love. Thank you for sending your son, Lord. We cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Lord, set our hearts on you this morning. We pray for the message that you would speak to us. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds. Renew us and refresh us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Living water. Uh, my name is John Abel, lead pastor. Good to see you guys all this morning. We love doing this. I'm really glad, as Noah said, we can actually be out here today. The weather is beautiful. I uh, cannot complain. You know, at the beginning of the week, it showed rain. We're all... I was praying hard. I'm hoping you guys were praying hard. Yeah, I prayed for the rain. It's my fault. You prayed things on for us. Come on. <laughs> Anyways, uh, if you are new, they said welcome. Um, in the welcome tent on your way out, make sure you grab a coffee mug if you haven't yet. Um, inside that coffee mug is a new card. Uh, please fill that out. We'd love to connect with you in some way this week. Um, I'll probably end up messaging you and trying to get to know you. So, uh, anyways, please fill it out um, as you're leaving and drop it in the offering box, which is also in the welcome tent as well. Uh, a couple of quick announcements uh, before we. And dive into the message this morning. Um, I'm probably going to forget half of them, but they're in your bulletin, so go your bulletin and look. Uh, I know we're, so we're going to be back here in the park one more time this summer, and it's going to be on uh, Labor Day weekend. I don't know what date that is, but it's a Sunday and Labor Day. I think it's September 5th, maybe. Uh, but we're going to be back here one more time this summer, do the same thing, breakfast, service. Uh, we're doing a food cart on the 21st, Veteran Moyer Park. It's over by the uh, Across the library, uh, we're doing, um, what are we doing for food? French fries, I know that. And I think we're doing some other good stuff. Um, what are we doing? Food. Barbecue. Barbecue chicken. So anyways, come out to that. Um, and also, uh, we just announced this week that we're actually doing a block party for the South End Teen Center for teenagers. So um, I mean, anybody can come, but it's, it's gonna be tailored towards teenagers. So if you are a teen, South End Teen Center, we're doing it at uh, Green Street Park in South End. We're going to do uh, bounce houses. We're going to have the food cart there, free food. Uh, it's totally free, um, and it's for teenagers. And so uh, if you're a teen, if you know the teen, tell them to go down South End Teen Center. I mean, Green Street Park, August 28th. All right, so before we dive into the sermon, I kind of just want to do a, a quick, just explaining why we do this. Um, I mean, it's much easier, honestly, as you probably can figure out, to do a service in our building. <laughs> uh, there's no setup. Uh, we're not the set. We don't, this is our sound system that we literally mat tears down and brings out here. Um, the band has to prepare on the public. Um, my iPad half the time I can't even see because of the glare from the sun. So you know, it's like, why do we do this? Um, and we as a church, if you are new with us, people that in our church know this. We are a church that believes we need to be in the community. We need to be surrounding ourselves with people that don't know Christ, be in the center of our community, and really not retreating. Uh, we understand that there's, there's spiritual war around us that we are engaging in, and um, it would make no sense for us to retreat and to hide behind sometimes four walls of church. And so we believe that it's so important for the church to be out in the community, to be worshiping in public, um, and the reason why is, is, as Jesus says, the church is a city on a hill that, that cannot be hidden. And the church has the light that the, that the world needs. And when we come out in the public, it's just for us, the church, to understand, especially us as Christians that have the light in us, 
we are we are light in a dark place. This this town, Waterville, and, and really all of Maine, if you understand the spiritual climate of where Maine is, it's very, very dark. There's we are as Christians a very small minority in this state. And as I said earlier in a sermon a few weeks ago, the change that Waterville needs, and really the change that the world needs, as much as more laws and more programs would, would help some things, I'm not against that, it's fundamentally and at the core, the foundationally, it's not what the world needs. It's really not. Like we can put all the laws and all the programs in place, but the, the truth of the matter is the, the answer to the darkness that is really causing all the problems that are around us. It's causing depression, it's causing anxiety, it's causing broken families, addiction, abuse, sexually and physically, like all, all the, the, the terrible things that are happening around us. What is causing that is people that don't know Jesus Christ. They're, they're far away from the answer, from the light that they truly need. And what the answer is to this world is the gospel. It's Jesus Christ, that is the answer. And what we believe as a church, the church needs to be the witness. The church it needs to go out with the power of the Holy Spirit that's in us and do what Jesus calls us to do, and that is to make disciples. And that's why we come out and do this. And just to understand this as a church, I, I, I truly believe this, is that the church will not fail at its mission. And sometimes we, we, we as Christians, we think that we are we're done for, or we look around us and we, we think, you know, things are unconquerable. Like, we, we can't, you know, see our community transformed. We can't see, even the, the things in your own life that you might see is unconquerable. You think you can't change them. We think about it, the, the problems around us look big. The problems in your life look big. But if you, li if you understand, the problems that Jesus faced was also big. And Jesus was on a cross, he died on a cross, crucified, they laid him dead in a tomb for three days. They thought he'd be in that tomb for all of eternity. If you put yourself back in that, that, that moment in, in history, they thought it was done for. It was unconquerable, nothing, nothing would happen. But they thought, that's what they thought. Little did they know that just a few days later, death would be conquered that death would be defeated, that the Jesus Christ would raise from the grave and do the one thing that no other person in human history could ever do, and that is to conquer death. And as Romans 8 says, nothing in all creation will separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus, because in Christ, through Christ, we are more than conquered because of Him who loved us. And what we're here to do today is we're here to proclaim that message that Jesus Christ can answer every single thing in your life, he is the light of the world, and He is the change that you need inside your life. All of us, Christian and non-Christian, He is the change we need. So before we dive in, we're in Ecclesiastes as a church. Um, I want to pray, and then we dive in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much, Lord, we can be out here. Thank you for the beautiful weather, Lord. I, I truly believe you bless us with this, God. And God, I pray for this, this, this message that your word right now would, would go forth, that would land on our hearts. I pray that the Holy Spirit is working right now, that, that the Holy Spirit is driving away the darkness that is trying to destroy what we're doing right now, God. I know, Lord, that as, as I've been praying, I know many others have been praying this entire week, that you would put a hedge of protect us around, protection around us right now, God. That, that, the, that the light that is, that is right here right now is just the body of believers that are here right now, that are shining bright, Lord. I pray that, that it will be seen. It will be heard. I know that I've already heard from other people that, that they can hear us right now, right in the concourse. They can hear us across in Winslow. Lord, I pray that this message, the music, the, the word that's going to be preached, God, I pray that it will go forth and people will be changed this morning, Lord. I pray you do a work in all of our hearts, every one of us, God. And I, Lord, I just want to pray a specific prayer uh, for, for our church, especially for um, uh, Rhonda uh, Garber, Lord. I, I, many of us know what's going on with Rhonda. Um, where there's cancer, Lord, it, it doesn't look good, Lord, but Lord, I pray your will be done, and Lord, I do pray for a complete miracle over her life, Lord. I pray you would heal her completely, Lord, and that um, she would be with us again, Lord. But uh, Lord, we trust in you, as we talked about last week, we, we, we fear you, God, and we know that you're in full control of all things. But Lord, I pray that right now, as we dive in your word, Lord, I pray my word becomes nothing, your word becomes everything. I pray we understand it. We are convicted by your word this morning. You are challenged by your word. We are even encouraged by your word, God. But most importantly, God, I pray you would change us. And Lord, I, bring, I pray you would bring a change to Waterville. And Lord, may this be the start of something. God, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let me start. I want to ask you guys a question this morning. And the question is, have you ever met a wise person? Have you ever met somebody wise in this world? 
And, and then when I ask this question, the reason why I ask is because we're going to look at, you're going to see this in the text this morning, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, is what makes a person wise? What, what, like, what things about them, what would you consider to be wise about them? And then the question would be is, is then what would wisdom look like? Like, so we, if you say, I know somebody that's wise, but what does that look like? What things about them make them wise? If you're joining us for the first time this morning as a church family, we've been really going through one of the toughest books of the Bible, I would probably say, it's Ecclesiastes. Um, it's tough to preach, it's tough, it's tough to understand, um, and it's, it's tough because it's written by King Solomon, arguably one of the wisest men to ever walk on earth. He had wisdom given to him by God, and one thing that makes Solomon so wise is he asks questions. And this is why this book's so hard to, to go through sometimes, because he asks the questions that many of us, what we do is we, we kind of put them up on the shelf. We don't, we don't try to figure out certain things in our life. As he digs into subjects that most of us don't go near because these subjects are tough. He tackles subjects about life and death. He tackles subjects about the meaning of, of life, the tough questions that we all are faced with, but most of us never look to find the answers. And what makes Solomon so wise is he's a man that seeked and searched to find the answers. And what we're going to look at today in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 is once again he asks these questions. He asks questions about life and he, he actually gives us some answers. So where we are today, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, if you have a Bible, go ahead and grab it. If you don't, um, there are some in the welcome tent, so I encourage you to go grab one right now. Um, if you don't have a Bible at all, um, you can please take one. Um, it's our gift to you. Um, we love giving away Bibles, so we'd love to leave with no Bibles. So please, take Bibles. Um, we give them away, so please. Um, so Ecclesiastes chapter 8, if you're new to the Bible, Ecclesiastes is about halfway in the Bible, so kind of open up halfway. You're going to find Psalms, you're going to find Proverbs. After Proverbs, you'll find the book of Ecclesiastes, and we are in, once again, chapter 8. So let's begin right in verse 1. You're going to see this two. Verse 1 is broken into two questions. You have give it to a question you have an answer so look at the questions first he says in verse one who is like the wise and who knows the interpretation of a thing so it's two parts and like i said it's question and answer the first thing he asked is uh, put, put this question in like this is there any that are wise in the world like he says is there who is like the wise and who knows the interpretation of a thing he's saying is there any people that are wise or any people that actually can interpret anything that goes on inside this life is there any person that really knows any of the true answers in life? And at first, if you've been following with us through the, through the book of Ecclesiastes, or if you know how Solomon writes, you would think the answer is no. Right? Because he writes very negatively. Most of the questions he asks already in this book are always no. Right? So you look at this first thing, who is like the wise, who is a wise person in this world, first you would think no one. Like no one's truly wise. No one can interpret anything in this world. But really what he's trying to kind of ask this question is that what if there was a wise person in the world? What if there was somebody that can interpret things? What if there's somebody that knew uh, what the, the right decision was to make in, in life? What if it was a person that could see what God sees? And what if it was a person that could, could do the right thing always? The question would be asked then is, is then how would wisdom show itself in that person? What would it look like? What would that person do? How would that person act? What would be the evidence of a wise person? Now, if you think about this, just in a worldly perspective, most of us would think, like when I asked the question at the beginning, have you ever met a wise person? Most of us would probably think a wise person is somebody that has a degree or a title of some sort. They have wealth or they have power, they have fame. Like somebody that has kind of kind of gain some kind of prominence in our life, politicians or, like I said, CEOs of businesses or a doctor, like those people, they are wise. But here's the thing that Solomon is trying to get us to try to wrestle with. Because here's the thing, Solomon had all of it. Solomon had wealth, he had knowledge, he had power. Like, and you understand that Solomon was king of Israel, that, that kings and queens would come and ask Solomon for advice. He was a very wise man. He had very good standing of people around him. But as he continues to write throughout his book, he continues to say, basically, he knows nothing. <laughs> like, here's the one, the wisest man to ever live on earth, and he says, I know nothing, because he doesn't know the answers to life. He doesn't know the, what, what the result of a thing is going to be. He can't interpret what, th how this is going to, to, to be. 
Because the reality is Solomon is, he is faced with as he searches out things in, in life, we know nothing of what is to come. But still, he's asking this because he's trying to get us to think for a minute, how do we judge a wise person? And how do we judge a wise person using God's standard? Like the, like the thing we, we're wrestling with, with this morning is there must be a way to be wise. So how would wisdom show itself in a person? Look at the second part of verse 1. He gives an answer. He said, a, wi a, a man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. And this is a strange answer. Okay, so we, we would think you would you'd hear something like, you know, a wise person would be good, or they would do good things, or they would, uh, they would be able, they would have wealth, or would have power. But he says, a wise person, face will shine. Their face is going to shine. And, and the hardness of their face will be changed. And it's strange because what Solomon says, the way wisdom is going to be seen, it's not going to be by oppressing others. It's not going to be by gaining titles. It's not going to be by graduating college or winning election, elections or moving to the top of the ladder or wealth or fame. Solomon's saying it's none of that. That's not how we judge wisdom. No, instead, what he says, he, put, he puts us in a statement. Wisdom is seen, I, and, I, and I put this like this, it's a radical life change that can be seen by others. It's a radical life change there, that can be seen by others. A life that is changed where their heart that used to be hard, where their facial expression literally showed their hard face. And I know many of us have met people like this, or you might be that person, where you have so much bitterness in your life, you have so much anger in your life, you're, you're, you're really miserable in, in your life, and, and it shows on your face. You have a frown, or even your, your Facebook feed shows it. You're always ranting, you're always angry, you're always kind of throwing these things out there, and it shows in your family. Like maybe on the outside you might look happy and joyful, but then when you get home behind closed doors, it comes out. But Solomon says when that hard heart is changed, so radically changed that it, your face shines. Like so, so radically changed that people can see it. They look at you and they say something's different about that person. Solomon says that's wisdom. That's wisdom. A radical life change that's so evident to others that it's undeniable that that person has been changed by something. So as we're looking, Psalm is kind of definitely painting the picture for us. There is a way to be wise in the world. But the way for us to be wise in the world is not the way the world sees it. It's different. So now we're really going to ask the question, what Psalm is going to get, going to get into you, is in how would you act? What would you do? What does it mean by your face is shining? Like, how would you portray yourself out in public? So what Solomon does, he goes on for the next few verses here, and he gives a scenario. And a scenario in life that I know every one of us can probably relate to, especially after 2020. Especially with some of the questions we, as Christians, have, have had to wrestle with. So look at verse 2. He says, I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. So Solomon, what he does first in verse 2, he sets up the example by giving us a command. And the command is to obey the king. Or in our context, because we don't have kings and queens, what he's saying is obey those in authority over us. And why do we obey? Solomon says here in verse 2, he says, because of God's oath to that person. The understanding is God has put that person in authority over us. Another passage that many of us probably have heard, especially over what has happened the past year, it's Romans 13, verse 1, is exactly what Solomon is saying here. Where it says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So Paul, Sol Solomon is setting up the example, a wise person will obey and submit to the authorities that God has given us. And all of us, Every single one of us here are under some kind of authority. And obviously we have the government. It's the first thing we think of, right? Kings and queens, you think government has authority over us. But, but you think police officers have authority over us. Uh, your boss in your workplace has authority over you. Uh, you have Even some of your family has authority over you. Like we, all, all of us have authority figures that, that are over us. Now what Solomon is going to do here in the next few verses, he's going to ask this question. And it's all going to paint the picture of what, what does it look like for your face to shine. 
Because your face shines brightest when things are evil around you. Understand that. When there's darkness around you, your face is going to shine more bright when there's more things that are wrong around you. So the psalm is going to paint the picture is what if the government is evil? What, what if the government or the, those in authority over you oppress others? They imprison and kill the innocent. Like there are Christians all around the world that are living in this, this situation right now. What if your boss or your manager is abusive and he, he cheats and he steals from customers and asks you to engage? Or what if you have a husband or even a wife or a parent in, in your life that is abusive? What do you do in those situations? And this is a scenario, like I said, most of us have ref, wrestled, wrestled with over the past year, especially with everything that has happened around us. And I'm not trying to get political here, but it's something that I know as Christians we've all tackled. Do we follow God rather than man when the government authorities or when the governing authorities are corrupt? Because Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the su supreme ruler over all things. Now, as we're going to see in the following verses, Solomon is going to give us an example of this scenario, of exactly what we're talking about, and how to act. How to let your face shine when evil is surrounding you. How to act wisely in an oppressive situation. And as I was writing this sermon, as I was kind of studying through this text, this text, honestly, we're going to read it, you're going to see it's kind of jumbled. And Solomon writes this way sometimes. It, it's, he's just like... <laughs> I, I kind of, a way I think it's like a word vomiting. He's just like throwing out all these different phrases, and you're kind of like, I don't know how to put these all together. So, <laughs> and it's really difficult sometimes. But a verse that kept coming to my mind, and it's funny, I, I didn't realize this. It's actually on my calendar at home. I didn't realize it after I wrote this, and maybe that's why it's on my mind. But it's Micah 6 8. And the verse says this in Micah 6 8. God is speaking to the prophet Micah, and this is what God says He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. So what does the Lord require? God requires us the way we shine bright around when evil is around us. If we do three things, you're going to see it in this text. We, love, we seek justice, we love mercy, and we walk humbly with our God. So I want to break down this text for us. Look at verse 3 through 8 to start. Saul so says, Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in the evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who must and who may say to him, What are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil. Will know no evil thing. And the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way, for there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be for who can tell him how it will be no man has the power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death there's no discharge from war nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it so let's break this down follow what psalms do he's giving an example of a man a man that you can see right in verse three it doesn't agree with the things that are going around him someone that is, that is authority over him is doing something that this man thinks is wrong I know all of us have been here. He said, whether it's the government, like I, I know right now if we went around this place and I asked all your political opinions, <laughs> there would be a fight. I know there would be. I know there's, there's many different opinions here, and that's fine. Right? We, we, I just talked today to somebody. What unites us is not our political alliances. What unites us is Christ. That is the key. Right? So like, I know we would all disagree here. But listen to Solomon's words. He says, don't be hasty to go from, it, from his presence. The understanding is, don't be so quick to abandon ship or take a stand. Don't be so quick to rebel. Because a quick response, many times, as verse 3 says, will actually lead you to aligning to an evil cause. It actually will end up causing you to align with, it, with an evil stance. Instead, a wise person, as verse 5 said, will, list, will wait for a proper time in the just way. See, a wise person, like I said, these three things. A wise person will seek justice. They're going to seek justice. This week, I was trying to think of what this would look like. like how does a person seek justice? Especially when verse 4 says that the king's word is supreme. I, I mean, most of us understand that it, sometimes, like, especially when you have people over and authority over you, you feel like you can't do anything. Like, everything you say just doesn't change anything. It's like that old song, I fought the law and the law won. You know that song? 
right? Yeah, I'm not gonna sing it, but you know what I'm saying. Like, like, and it's like the understanding is you can fight the law all you want, but you're not gonna change anything. You keep fighting, fighting, and it just seems like nothing ever changes. So how does a person seek justice? Especially as verse 8 says that there's no way to avoid war, there's no way to avoid conflict, because there's always going to be wickedness in this world. There's always going to be darkness, there's always going to be oppression, there's always going to be wicked leaders, corrupt politicians, abusive bosses, abusive uh, husbands and, and wives and, and, and parents. It's always going to be that way. So when is the right time to rebel? When is the right time to seek justice, as verse 6 implies? There must be a time for everything. And what verse 7 gives us is a sobering re reality. The reality is, is that, yes, we all want to seek justice, but we don't know what is going to happen in the end. We don't know when the time actually is to rebel. Like many of us would say, like, we need to rebel now, we need to fight now, we need to stand up now, but really, what if it's not the right time? We don't know God's ways. We don't know when is the right time to stand up. But here's the thing. What the Bible is saying, what, 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 what Psalm is trying to make clear to us, is what we must always do is seek justice in all circumstances. We seek justice no matter what someone else tells you. We do what is right in all circumstances. We do what is right even if the government tells us to do something wrong. If your boss tells you to do this thing that is evil or wrong and sinful, you don't do it. If your husband or wife or parent is, is leading you down the wrong path, you don't go that way. To seek justice means you are consistent. You pursue justice always. You don't waver. You don't bow to the culture. You don't bow to what the people are doing around you. Even if... if, if Following and seeking justice means you will be put in prison or you even will be killed. You take a stand against that. You always seek justice no matter what is going on around you. That's what is being said. Sometimes you don't even need to rebel. Sometimes it's just remaining firm and seeking justice. That is rebellion. I could get into more of this because, I mean, there's so much about this. As, as, I mean, if you look into history... If you ever look into tyranny and how it starts, the first thing, the first people they want to silence is the Christians. Because the Christians seek justice no matter what's going on around them. It's always the case. It's because we shine brightest when there's evil around us. The next thing, the reason why we seek justice is because we love mercy. Solomon goes on in verse 9 through 11, he says this, All of this I have observed while applying my heart to know that to know, to <laughs> applying my heart to all that is done under the sun. When man had power, o when man had power over man to his hurt, then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the in the city, where they had done such things. This also is vanity, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. So Solomon, what he does, he tells us one of his observations. And his observation is, is he's looking at these different scenarios in, in life, and he's noticed that, that a person that is, has no mercy, and they have power in, in some sort in, in this, this life, and they lord their power over others to hurt other people. And instead of this person being villainized, Instead of the world seeing the person as evil, they are actually praised. And because their actions are not condemned quickly, verse 11 is going to say that, that more people follow in their footsteps. More people will become evil. And we see this cycle all over the world. A ruthless leader that uh, treats his citizens awful. And when he dies, that statues are put up in, in his honor. It's like verse, verse 10 saying that they're praised in the city that they abuse their citizens. Like I think of a, a famous scene uh, back in the, the Iraqi uh, war that we had, uh, the war against terrorism, with Saddam Hussein when his, when his statue came down. Here's a guy that literally abused the people in his own country. Statue was put up his honor and just the scene when it came down. Or you could think even Nazi Germany with Hitler. I mean, much as we look at Hitler now as an evil person, when he was in Germany, they loved him. Germans loved this guy. They would praise him. They would, they would, they would sing songs. They would join and like saluting this man. 
You see it when, when, a, when, a, when a, a kid or a son especially grows up and his father's abusive and the, the son says, I'm never going to do that to my wife or my kids. Then when they grow up, they do the same exact thing their father did. You see this all the time. You understand a wise person is going to act merciful. It's going to be it's going to act merciful no matter the scenario they are in in life, no matter the person that they are in contact with. They love mercy, and what that means is you love others at all times. Now, many of us as Christians, we would say, well, of course, we love the victims, we love those that are being oppressed. That makes sense. But understand the one that loves mercy. As the text saying, will even love the abuser. They don't, they don't, they don't agree with what they're doing. They don't agree with that at all. But they love them. They love the corrupt king and the politician. One that loves mercy will even love their enemy. Yes, you want justice to be served. Yes, you want that person to pay for the punishment. The Bible is very clear on, on the idea of punishment. Punishment must be served. Justice must be gained. That is very clear. But one that loves mercy, they want the abuser to change. They want the person that has a hard heart to be transformed. They want the person that, that is hard, that is evil. They want that person to be turned into a new creation. That's a person that loves mercy. And you say, why in the world would any person want to love those that, that are evil? Why would we want to love mercy? I mean, you're going to be run over. Nothing's going to ever change if you love mercy. If we never take a stand, we never stand up against those we, are, we disagree with, nothing's ever going to change. And the reason why we do this, because the wise way, the last thing, the wise, the wise way that makes our face shine in darkness is to walk humbly with our God. It's to walk humbly with our God. Look at the last two verses we're going to go over this morning. Verse 12 to 13. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow, but he does not fear before God. As this text is saying, the sinner, the evil person, they, they might seem like their power never ceases. Verse 12 says they will do evil a hundred times over and the life is prolonged. We look at this all around the world. We see people just doing evil and we think, why doesn't it just end? I mean, using Hitler's example again, I mean, he killed millions before justice was served. Slavery endured hundreds of years before the world, in the world before it was abolished in, in the majority of the world. Even now, Radical Islam kills thousands of people. Chinese government imprisons and kills many Christians. North Korea's regime is still enslaving their own citizens. It's illegal in that country, North Korea, just to even have a Bible. You could be sentenced to, to, to prison or even killed for this. The list of tyranny could go on around the world. It's, it's evident. We know it. But listen, a wise person knows this, that God is the one that will end the wicked and the tyranny in the world. It is God that's going to do it. It is Him that is going to set things right. As verse 13 says, and I love this, it says, It will not go well with the wicked. It will not go well with the wicked. Their day will come to an end, and it's because they do not fear God. Because they do not fear God, it will not go well with them. But look at verse 12 when it says, It will go well with those that fear God. It will go well with those that walk humbly behind him. As we talked about last week, fearing God, it says in this text, is putting God in his rightful place as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the true king of this world. The one that knows all things and know, that knows all the outcomes. The one that holds wisdom in the palms of his hands. A wise person will humbly acknowledge that I don't know what is best. I don't know the future. A wise person humbly acknowledge that, that we are wicked. Every one of us are wicked. We are the sinners. 
before a holy God, ye understand as Christians that, that our sin stinks just as much as the abuser and the wicked, wicked and the evil in this world. We have the same sin. Yes, their corruption is, 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 is doing more evil in this world, but our hearts, every one of us as, as humans, is the same. We have the same capacity to do evil. And this leads us back to the question that, that Solomon is asking in the beginning. How would wisdom show itself in this world? And it's through a person that seeks justice, love mercy, and walks humbly with our God. A life lived this way will, will make his face shine. A life lived this way will radically change your life. It will change everything about you. And why is this? Because to walk humbly with God means that you humble yourself before a holy God and you recognize that you are not wise. All of us must do this. You recognize that you are not merciful. We're not. This is why when we, we want to stand up against evil, this is why we, 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 we can't, this is why many of us hold grudges in our life. We humble ourselves before a holy God and we understand that we don't know what true justice actually is. But one that walks humbly with God will seek it. They will seek it out and they want it. This is the radical life change that Solomon is talking about. And what I want to do, I want to read a verse for us that, just to kind of close this, this sermon out, that I think portrays how to have this radical life change so well. It explains everything that Solomon is saying here. It's one of my favorite passages in all scripture, and I love because it explains the gospel out so well. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. It says this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You understand what the first part of this text is saying, that we, all of us, all of us were dead, and we were dead because of our sin. We have no life, we have a hard heart. We're enslaved by the ruler of the world. We're blinded by the darkness that the enemy cast over us. We can't see clearly. We can't see what is right. We don't know what is right. We don't know what is, what is good and don't know what is truly evil. We're blinded. But the verse goes on. I love this. Verse 4 it says this. It says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, dead in our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, and it's not of your own doing, it's a gift of God. It's not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. Listen to what this text is saying. You want life change? You want freedom? You want to know what true wisdom is? You want to know how wisdom shows? You want your face to shine brightly? You want a radical life change? Turn to the one that seeked justice for you. As the other text say, the one that seeked justice for you. And the way he did it is by coming to earth to die for us. He died our death. He paid our penalty. As the creator of this world said, the true ruler, the king of this world, as God said, the wages of sin is death. And Jesus paid that wage on the cross. He died for our sins. And you ask what drove him to do it. Ephesians 2, you so clear here. It's his mercy. It's his love that he had for us, for all of us. It's so amazing. And you understand that his, his life 
was so marked by love. He lived out mercy so perfectly that even when he was on the cross, when he's hanging naked on a cross, nails in his hand, his body is beaten to a pulp. Where he was standing, I know most of those pictures that the cross is up high. The cross was down low. And he was face to face with his enemies. He's face to face with the ones that just nailed him to the cross. And they're spitting at him and they're mocking him. One of the words that Jesus says, we have recorded in scripture, is he looked at all those that are persecuting him. All his enemies. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That is somebody that loved mercy to the very end. The one that would seek justice even for his enemies. He says, Father, forgive them. I want them to have justice. I want them to be able to know you. I want them to be forgiven, even his complete enemies. That is love and that is mercy. And listen, that was justice. And that justice was served, and that justice was served against the prince of the power of the air, the ruler, the false ruler of this world that causes the chaos in this world. You understand, all the chaos and all the evil in this world, it comes from sin. That's where it comes from. And what happened was Jesus defeated sin on that cross. And when he rose from the grave, he rose over sin. He broke the chains that hold us down. He broke the chains that hold you to your sin. So that those that fear God, those that will humble themselves and will walk with him, they will, they will not receive the justice that they deserve. That's the justice we deserve is death because of our sin. But, but because of him, because he served that justice for us, we receive mercy and love because of Christ. And none of us can boast because of this. This is why none of us can boast that we are wise. None of us can boast that we are great. We're nothing great. We're only great because it is Christ that shines through us. How is a person wise? It is through Christ. That's why a wise person is through somebody who has a radical life change. That radical life change comes through Christ. And when Christ is in you, your face shines differently. Now look around this place. I, I can see, I know some of you right now. I met you when you, were, when you were first following Christ, when you first asked Christ in your life. And I have seen the life change. I've seen your life change. I've seen just your, your face literally go from just being just down and hard to a face that is shining bright and your smile and you're different. I've seen it. And what I want to end with is this, is you can have that today too. You can have that radical life change. And I would tell you this, is that when, when this is all over, I would say, please, if you have questions, don't just leave and stuff those questions. To feel God drawing you, to feel God stirring something inside your heart right now. Maybe you consider yourself a Christian, but God's still stirring something in there. I would say, seek somebody. Find somebody in a blue shirt around you. You come talk to me right after. But if you feel that pull, that pull is coming from the Holy Spirit and He's drawing you to Himself right now. And don't run from that. Don't run from that. Run to Him this morning. So with that, let's, let's bow our heads and let's, let's pray. Lord God, Father, we just thank You. We thank You for the fact that <laughs> we did not we do not receive the, the justice that we deserve. Because you seek justice for us, God. We thank you that you love us and you show mercy towards us, Lord. Mercy that we don't deserve. God, what I pray is that all of us around this room, or, or part, I should say, we would receive a radical life change this morning, God. Christian and non-Christian, maybe the Christian in here, they need to repent of something in their life right now. They're harboring some kind of grudge. They've been distant from you for a long time. I pray right now, God, you bring them back to you. Help their hard heart to change. And help their face shine brightly once again, Lord. And God, for those that are here, Wherever they might be, spread around this park, God, I pray that 
that today is the day of their salvation. Today is the day where they turn their life over to you, where they will humbly surrender and they will seek you. They'll find answers. Their life will be changed. Their life will be transformed. I know you're stirring in people's hearts right now. I know you are, Lord. I know you're doing it around this place. I transform this community. Help this community to shine bright. Help the masses, Lord, to have radical life change. I, I, I pray for an end to drug addiction. I pray for an end to broken families. I pray to, for, for an end to all the evil that's around us, all the tyranny around us. To all the corruption that's around us, God, is there. We all know it. We can see it. I pray for an end. I pray you bring that end, God. And Lord, I pray you start with us here today. Change us, God. Transform us. We love you. We thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you, church. We're going to stand and sing one more song together. And as we do, I, I always encourage you um, just humble yourself before God. Humble, humble yourself before this moment. Just if you got to sit, you got to stand, you got to find a quiet place to pray. Just, just seek Him this morning and don't leave this place without your heart in the right place before God. So let's just stand all. Let's just sing this, this last song together. You're the God of this city, you're the King of these people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless.
Dear Heavenly Father, we lift you up in this city, Lord, uh, literally. Uh, we thank you for a beautiful day and uh, just a space to, to come out and do this. And we just pray that uh, through this service, through the music, through the message, that um, people that came here today, people that are just walking by, we just pray that they heard um, heard about you and, and uh, we just pray that there was a seed that was planted. We just pray that you you water it, Lord. Uh, we love you. Thank you for loving us in spite of our, our sinful nature. Lord, it isn't us that changes, but it's you that changes us. We're just willing to, to let you. I pray that if there's anybody here that um, hasn't let you, Lord, hasn't let you change, change them. They're still wondering and still asking questions. And I just pray that um, they'd reach out to somebody here. I pray that this is the day that they turn their life to you, Lord. We pray that you, you bless our day wherever we go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a great rest of the day.